Hey! Whew! Greetings from a very sweaty man. It's warm out there. I've just done 13 and a half miles or something with 20 kilos on me back. My last long walk before the fan dance, which is a week on Saturday. I'm shitting myself. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough, but I'm going to do it. So that was my last long walk. I've got next Wednesday, I'm going to go and out and do eight miles just without a backpack. And then on the Saturday, that's the fan dance. It's going to, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be really hard. Rick, hey! You bet you're back in the, uh, what was it? It's Wednesday. Now you'll be back in the States, won't you? Thank you for Sunday, by the way. It was awesome. I loved it. It was so cool. Ants on as well. It's funny that, right? I, I, um, the guys who come to the bar target busy guys who are, who are busy, right? And I bumped into one of the guys on the way back from a walk today, right? First thing he said, he was like, oh, are you off now? Then I was like, I'm going home. He goes, oh, fancy a pint. <laughs> this is it like, what was it, three o'clock in the afternoon? It's like all these busy guys. Mm, mm. Anyway, anyway. I was talking to a guy in the park yesterday. I was talking to a guy in the park yesterday. We just had a session. I had a session at seven and then a one at half nine. And then after the one at half nine, I, I, I did my own little workout because I, like I like to do it outside. It's just nice, right? Um, being out and about. I mean, it was, the weather wasn't great, but it doesn't matter. You're still outside. And I was in the little shelter. And I see this guy most days, but I've never spoken to him. And he's there with his little dog. And he's like, his little he's, he's got this little, I don't know what type of dog it is, but it's a little one. And it's always got a massive stick. And a big smile on his face, and he chucks the stick for it, and it goes mental, it goes mental, it's brilliant, I love to see it. And he's in the park every day. Um, and then he came up in the middle of... Uh... <laughs> I I, I would have done, I would have done, but I was knackered. When I get home, I take the pack off on my shoulders, I so, and I was really sweaty as well. Like, yeah, I stank when I got in, you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't want to know that. Um, you wouldn't want to sit and have a pint with me. But anyway, good man. Yeah, so, I was talking to this guy. I was, I was in the middle of my workout where I was doing 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. So it was quite, I couldn't really talk. And usually, I get pissed off with people when they come and talk to me, right? Which is a bit weird because I'm doing some weird stuff in the park. So people are going to want to talk to me anyway. Yeah, another time in my life. People are going to want to talk to me anyway, right? So, you know, because it is a bit weird. It's just the way it is. Um, there's a lot of tourists about and they come up and they're, they're inquisitive and they want to know. So I'm always kind of like, you know, I always try to be inclusive, shall we say. And this guy, so this guy started talking to me, just asking what I was doing. And he said, oh, I see you down here most days and all that sort of stuff. So in the, in the middle of each set, I had, I had 15 seconds, so I had a quick chat. I was meant to do 25 minutes, I did 20 minutes instead. Because I thought, you know what, he's, he's not going anywhere, he's not going anywhere. He's going to stay here and keep talking to me, and I'm tired anyway. I could have done 25 minutes. I finished at 20 minutes, and I felt great. Which would have killed... Like, a couple of weeks ago, I tried the same thing. I did 17 minutes, so I did extra while talking to somebody as well. So that was... It kind of took my mind off it. Bit of distraction. Anyway. Anyway. This guy turned out to be really interesting. Meet some interesting people in the park you do. This guy turned out to be really interesting. We were just having a chat with him. You know, and he was kind of, like, asking about the stuff that would do... Um, you know, and I said like, oh, you know, it's kind of like guys who are really busy, haven't got time to, to, to get any fitness in really, or the, the, you know, if they do, they think they need to use, they think they need to have loads of time to be able to do it. Um, you know, and then, and then I just, I don't know, I don't know how we got onto it, but we just started talking about stuff and I, I kind of, you know, I just asked him like what he did because he was in the park a lot and stuff like that. And I just asked him what he did and he said he... He said, and I asked him about his dog, that was it. And he said it was a rescue dog. Um, and I was like, oh, well, that's nice. You know, this guy was like, you know, he must be in his 60s, I think. He looks like he is. You never know in the park. Some of the guys are in the 30s and they look like they're in the 60s because of that 79p cider that they drink. But anyway, anyway, um, yeah, I asked him about his dog. You know, he's a lovely little dog, which is a big smile on his face and the biggest stick you've ever... So the dog's about this big and the sticks are this big. It's hilarious. It's brilliant. I love it. And, yeah, so he said it was a rescue dog. And then he said he did some volunteering, like, for homeless, stu homeless charities and stuff like that. Um, because he was himself. And he's not anymore. 
but he was a ho- he was homeless and he was a drug addict and he you know he was basically doing himself in and now he's he does he's not he's off all of that um i can't remember how we got onto this totally but anyway he's off all of that and i and i kind of said something you know because i mean I've, I've not been there but you know i used to drink loads um i used to smoke a load of weed when i was younger as well uh started doing that when i was about 14 which which is quite young um but it was very enjoyable um yeah so it was i, I kind of i kind of tried to relate to him with 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 what i've been doing right because i you know i was i was i had a job that i did for 12 years that i hated for the last five of it i never felt very good at it so i always felt that i was i don't know that i wasn't appreciated in it or you know and i didn't appreciate myself in it okay and it, i always felt like i was the worst in my team i always felt like i was holding the team back i always felt rubbish and that was for 12 years for the last five, I definitely felt like that. Then I got made redundant, right? Which is, isn't a surprise, really, if you don't really perform very well for five years. But that was because my heart wasn't in it. So then I started to do what I'm doing now, which was massively, I was massively insecure because it was totally new. It was totally new. Yusuf son, hello. It was totally new. So I was massively insecure. It's an insecure industry because everybody, you know, there's loads of people around who want to get ripped and all that. And that's usually... There's usually some sort of insecurity involved in that. And I take the piss out of people like that, and that's because I'm insecure about it, because I don't look like that. I don't particularly want to look like that, because I wouldn't have the discipline to be able to do that. I've got the discipline to train and the discipline to keep myself strong, but I wouldn't have the discipline uh, to get a, a ripped, a proper ripped six-pack and massive bulging muscles. It's not what I want. It's not what I want. And people are scared of that, so then people ridicule that because... It's something that they... It's not necessarily something they don't, they don't want. It's something that, that they know they could probably never get. So therefore, they ridicule it because then at least they can say, well, at least I'm not like that. Anyway, so this was, this was what happened. I, I, I found this out very quickly about the fitness industry that it's full of lots of insecure people, okay? Because everyone's trying to run their own business as well and they've got no idea how to. So I was like, right, I'm going to learn how to run my own business. So when I, was, when I eventually set up Bath Kettlebell Society, I was down in the park, I had one guy two years ago, two years ago, just May, just gone, I had one guy, one guy, he turned up, Andy, he still comes along now, he turned up and he was like, how many people you got on your books and all that, we just had a bit of a chat, you know, because it was just me and him, and I was like, to be honest, it's me and you at the minute, it's a society of two, right, massively insecure, however, because I've been made redundant and gone into that, I got a bit depressed, not like suicidal or anything like that, but I, 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 got, I went really down, really down, because I had all of this pressure on me to try and build this thing, and I had no clue what I was doing. No clue what I was doing. But I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't talk to anybody around me about it, okay? I just, I was like, everything's fine. People are like, how's business? Oh yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And they could see it wasn't. So then people are like, why don't you try, if somebody, somebody said to me, well, why don't you try targeting golfers? This was a person who plays golf. Why don't you try targeting golfers? Because they need a bit of strength in that. And I was like, yeah, I know now about golf. Well, just go to the golf club and talk to them. It's like, they don't know who I am. And I've got no interest in doing that. But they, all of a sudden, someone, you know, and I was already setting up what I was setting up. But like, that was just a bit of a, that was one thing. I, got, I was getting this from all over the shop. And I dealt with it really badly. Rather than just saying, yes, thank you very much. That's a good idea. And filing it in me, um, you know, in me, a little bullshit. <laughs> Fool, don't say thank you for your, thank you. I'll I'll put I'll I'll take that on board. I didn't, and I got really defensive about it. Okay, so I was out I was out of control. I was out of control, and I was totally couldn't. I just I just couldn't get my head around why everyone was trying to give me advice, and it was because it was clearly obvious that I didn't know. I did. I thought I knew. I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought I was masking that, but everyone can see it. Everyone can always see it. If there's a problem, you try and hide it. Everyone can always see it, right? So then that was gave me problems, you know, at home with my with my wife. She she didn't she didn't get. Or I thought she didn't get it, so I didn't talk to her about it. So that pushed her away. Um, and then and, and that really that that ended up ending my marriage. Um, and that that was really hard. That was horrible. But she didn't want to spend any time with me, and quite rightly so, because I was being a twat. And I created this. But I could blame her for it because I was, I was, I was like, well, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. I'm depressed. I'm depressed and you don't get it. 
but I didn't talk to her about it, so therefore, whose problem's that? Okay, you know, so these things happen. So basically, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because this guy had been on heroin. He said he never injected it, but he used to smoke it or whatever you do with it. I, can't, I don't know what you do with it, but anyway, he used to do something with it. Um, so, something with it to make him feel better. But it, it didn't make him feel better, you see. You know, it, it doesn't, it makes you feel worse, right? It makes you feel better for a time, but then it makes you feel worse. So I was doing similar things with that, like, drink, you know, drinking and all of this sort of stuff. And I started smoking again a bit and um, not weed, but just smoking cigarettes again because I was like, all oh, right, I'll have a go. And it, and, and it was horrible. Um, but unless you've gone through something like that and come out the other side, you don't sort of realise, you don't, you don't get to realise what matters. So while I was, while I was at work, and not miserable in my job, but I just didn't like it. But then weekends would come and it'd be like, way hey, brilliant, which is most people in life really. They, they go to work, it's, they hate it. And then they get to the weekend and they go, way, and then they get pissed and then they go to work and then they get pissed the next weekend and then they go to work and they go, right, this is it, this is life. And I got, I got to the point when I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to have to do this for another 25 years. And then, and then, and then what? <laughs> How boring is that? So anyway, and it was forced on me to change that anyway. So this guy, when I was talking to him about that, I mentioned that and I said, you've kind of got to have something that just punches you in the face and says, change. And his was, he was on, he was on drugs and he just said, he thought he had no family. This is what he thought, he did. I don't know about kids and stuff, but he's got three stepbrothers, he said, and a stepdad who he doesn't know. Um, but you know his mum was with this guy and all that sort of stuff and he said he just thought nobody loved him he thought you know and I, and I said like while you were doing all these drugs and everything were you thinking about anyone else or you were just thinking about yourself and he was like I was just thinking about myself I didn't I, I wasn't you know I was thinking about myself just thinking like right I'm down and, and he hated himself and then he realised and then I don't know how I didn't go into it with him obviously I didn't ask him loads of questions we were just having a bit of a chat and then he realised actually there was a bunch of people around him who, who were worried about him so he had some support and then and then he got out of it. And then after that he started that was when he got better and he's so now he, he goes down the park with his dog, chucks his little dog with a massive stick, chucks chucks the stick for the dog, the dog's tail's wagging, it goes but its little legs go like this and it's it's got the biggest smile on his face. He's rescued this or he's he's got this dog from a rescue place. So this dog's had a bad life, so he recognises that. And he kind of got it. He he got it, or he got that I got it as well. Even though mine hasn't been as like as extreme as his, but you have to kind of go through a bit of a pit to get to the other side. Or you go into the pit and then you just go back to what's comfortable. So I could have gone, you know, when I lost my job, I could have gone there and then went right. I'll just go get another job in the same industry that I hate, and carry on doing it. Or I could do the uncomfortable thing and just forge a path forwards, which is what I did. So, what's this got to do with anything? What has it got to do with anything? Well, I was reading a book the other day that I've read before. So what I do is when I read a book and it kind of, it has loads in it and you can't take it in, you know? So there's all these people who've got like bookshelves and bookshelves of books and they're like, look at me, I'm, look at that, I've got loads of books. And then it's like, well, yeah, have you read me? Well, not really. Or what insights did you get from this book? What what did you learn? You know, not not I'm not talking fiction books because you know they're great, but like books that you can learn stuff from. What what did you get from that one? And they'd be like, I, I don't know. There's a guy, the the coaching group that I'm in, that I that I pay for, that I'm part of. Um, there's a guy in there every time. Like if you say oh, I've just read this book and it was great, he just says right, tell us three insights that you got from it. And then and then I do because you know. That's, that's, I get, I get that now, but uh, you know, the, the, there'll be people you say, well, what, what insights did you get from it? They go, well, I, I don't know really, it was just quite, quite a good book and entertaining that. It's like, well, you know, if you didn't learn anything from it, what's the point? So what I do now, and my coach told me to do this, and it works, is if I've got a book and I get loads of, loads, or I feel like it will give me loads of insights, I go back through it and I just, I just open it, read it, I've got, I've got my Kindle here, which it's on, and I've got a book here. That's just like, that's just sitting next to me on the table, actually. I haven't staged this. It's sitting next to me on the table, but this has got all the insights in it that I just put put down, just little little pearls of wisdom that help me out. And every, so I open the book, 
have a read and then when I get an insight, I'll write it down in my own words and then I'm like, right, done, close the book. That's it, that's done for the day. And then that's like, I take that with me and and get, you know, kind of look at, look, look at things that are going on and with that insight, okay? So, yeah, so one of them was, in this book that I'm reading, was why, why do people... So, th so this whole thing is about why, why do people wait? Why do people wait until the right time to do something? And then it said, if you had a one year left to live. So we, we were talking about this in the pot. This is quite, um, it's quite, what's the word? Anyway, it's, it's pertinent. That's the only word I can think of. Because, you know, there's a, the, like, like my old man died when he was 65 of cancer, which was far too young. Um, there's a couple of guys who are coming to the who come to my sessions, and they've got that. Both of them know a guy who's just died, who was forty. I think he was forty or forty-five, who just died of cancer. So they were talking about that, and then we, you know we were talking about it with there was a there was a few of us, and we're all kind of in our forties, late thirties, early forties. We we're saying we, we all you, most people know someone who's who's got cancer or died of cancer or beaten cancer or whatever, right? Most people know someone who's who's died far too young, okay? And then we were talking about, like, isn't it amazing? You know, there's, like, two ways you can go. You can find out you've got an illness or even a terminal illness, and then you can go, oh, and go depressed about it and stuff like that. Or you get the people who go and often do stuff, and they'll go, right, I'm going to smash everything until, until I can't anymore, okay? Why wait until then? Why wait until then? If you were given a year to live now, from now, you went to the doctor's today and said you've got one year to live, what would you do? What would you do? Okay? And then think about, well, why wouldn't you do that now? If you think you've got 50 years to live, why wouldn't you just do it now? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you just do it now? And this, if somebody said that to me five years ago, I'd be like, yeah, whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter. I've got a job and I'm earning loads of money and it's fine. I go on like, you know, I've got five weeks off a year and I go on like a big two-week holiday to to somewhere nice and then, you know, have the odd week week in Europe and weekends away and all that. It's fine. I don't, I don't you know, that's it. That's all I want. That's life. However, I wasn't making a difference. I wasn't, you know, I, I, was, I was earning money in a job that was soulless. It didn't, it didn't actually give anything back to anyone. It didn't do anything. I was just making money for a company which made money for me. So that didn't give me anything. And I always felt soulless doing it, but I didn't know what else to do. It's all I knew. So now, now I'm helping people get fitter, stronger and healthier. And it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. And I wish I'd done it years ago. However, I can't worry about that. I didn't do it years ago, so there's no point in worrying about that because I'm only 40 years of age. If I've got another 40 years in this world or even 60 years, that's loads of time. It's loads of time. If I had one year left, I'd still do it. I would still do it. I remember my dad, when we found out he was ill, he didn't want to know. He didn't want to know anything. He knew he had cancer, but he didn't want to know how long he had left. And it was inoperable. He had chemotherapy, radiotherapy, which flattened him. But every now and then he felt well. And, and me and my brother were saying, why don't we go on holiday? Go on holiday. We, we weren't pressuring him, but we just, we've just probably done his edit a bit, actually. And I, I, I regret that. But it was like, why don't you go on holiday? And he was like, no, I'm fine being at home. He loved being at home. He loved being at home. He lived in a two-bed bungalow that he bought with my mum in the 1960s that me and my brother grew up in. So four of us in a two-bed bungalow. That, that's another story in itself. Anyway, it was a bloody nightmare. <laughs> So four of us in a two-bed bungalow, but he lived in this two-bed bungalow. We didn't have any holidays when we were younger. We went to Scarborough one week out of the year, I think. That's all we could afford, because he was he wanted to pay the mortgage off. So we never went away. We, you know, and he wanted to pay the mortgage off as quickly as possible. This, this was a house, this was a two-bed bungalow in Newcastle that like he probably bought for like two grand in 1965 or something like that. But he paid it off and then he was like, right, I've got no worries now. But it was like, well, what, so what, what are you gonna do? And he still never went away. They still never went anywhere. So when he got terminally ill, I was like, go off, go off and do stuff, go off and do He was like, no, I'm happy, I'm happy where I am, I'm happy at home. And that was his thing. And he was, and he loved his garden. He built a pond. That was his thing. He loved it. He fed the birds in the garden. They used to line up on the wall. This was amazing. They used to line up on the wall. You'd get up in the morning and the birds were all lined up on the wall. Not like, yeah, but all lined up on the wall waiting for me dad to go out and feed them. 
because he, he that's what he did and he absolutely loved it so that was that was his thing but like i said talking to this guy in the park he was he was he'd already he's all he's already had that moment as well of i could have gone so what am I going to do now? And now he's perfectly happy. I was talking to him. He was he was he was a great bloke. He, he he's got his little dog on the stick, and he chucks the stick, and the dog goes for it, and he 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 does some stuff for a homeless charity. He volunteers. He, the dog was a rescue dog. All of that. He's like he just wants to make a difference, and he absolutely loves it. And he's making his, he's making his difference, and he just he was he was great, great bloke, absolutely great bloke. So there you go. So. God knows how long this has gone on for. Sorry, it's probably gone on a bit long. But this is this is the thing. This is what this is what I'm talking about. If you had one year left to live, what would you do? What would you do? Okay. There you go. And the chances are that if you get fitter, stronger, and healthier, you'll have more years left anyway, aren't they? Yeah, I had to say that at the end, didn't I? I had to say that at the end. But anyway, there you go. Just think about that. And I'll talk to you tomorrow when I'm less tired. Ta-ra!